أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد وعجل فرجهم واللعنة دائمة على أعدائهم أجمعين إلى قيام يوم الدين رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Brothers and sisters in Islam, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh In our previous lecture, we shed light on certain verses in Surah Al-Shu'ara that mentioned what Nuh alayhi salam said to his people We shed light firstly on his word أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Won't you be pious? And we explained that it makes perfect sense for Nuh alayhi salam to demand his people to be pious, although they were disbelievers, because piety is a deep concept. And there are different types of piety. Piety in beliefs, piety in practices, and piety in morals. Hence, when he says, أَفَلَا تَتَّقُونَ Won't you be pious? He is telling them to believe in the truth and to disbelieve in falsehood, just as he's telling them to perform the deeds that please Allah Azza wa Jal and to refrain from performing deeds that displease the Almighty. Secondly, we shed light on the word أَطِعُون Obey me. And we said this word indicates that Nuh alayhi salam is infallible because when a group of people are commanded to obey a particular person without limits, to obey him at all times, this indicates the individual is infallible. Because if he wasn't infallible, there would be a possibility that he misses them. There would be a possibility that he commands them to sin instead of commanding them to obey Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So long that this possibility exists, Allah azza wa jal won't command us to obey a particular person without limits. So when Nuh says, Atihuni, obey me, we understand that this type of obedience has no limits, that they should obey him at all times. Hence, he must be infallible. This was the second point we mentioned. A third point we mentioned was the word of Nuh alayhi salam regarding recompense. The recompense for his message. As he said, according to, according to Surah Al-Shu'ara, وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مِنْ أَجْرِ إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ He told his people that I do not ask you for a recompense for it, meaning for delivering the message. Took us where? It took us to the recompense of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. We said that when we skim through the Holy Quran from cover to cover, we find that all the prophets mentioned in the Quran never ask their people for a recompense for delivering the message. Except for one messenger, the final and greatest messenger, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. He did ask for a recompense. As Allah says, قُلْ لَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَىٰ أَجْرَىٰ إِلَّا الْمَوَدَّةَ فِي الْقُرْبَىٰ Say, I do not ask, I do not ask you for a recompense for it, meaning for delivering the message, except loving my near relatives. The question that we asked yesterday is why would he ask for a recompense? If you remember, we connected certain verses, the verses in the Quran that speak about the recompense of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and we came out with the following conclusion, Rasulullah never asked the people for a worldly gain or a worldly benefit in exchange of delivering the message. Rather, he demanded them 
to love Ahlul Bayt and considered that to be the recompense for delivering his message because Allah and Rasulullah wanted to show us the unique and great status that Ahlul Bayt والسلام, hold in the eyes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because loving Ahlul Bayt benefits us. So the recompense of Rasulullah, Mawaddat al Qurba, loving Ahlul Bayt, السلام, in reality, the nation. We are the ones who are in need of loving Ahlul Bayt, السلام, for their love will lead us to salvation and eternal mercy. Then again, we are the ones who will be harmed if we despise Ahlul Bayt. For despising them will lead us where? It will lead us to eternal punishment. All of these points were mentioned yesterday. The last point we mentioned was the following. And from here, we start with the new lecture. The last point we mentioned was when we read Surah Al-Shu'ara, we find that multiple prophets said Certain words said the same word to their people. They said the same words to their people. What words are we referring to? The following ones. Inni lakum rasulun ameen. Surely I am a messenger sent to you. And I am trustworthy. Fattakullaha wa atihoon. So fear Allah and obey me. وَمَا أَسْأَلُكُمْ عَلَيْهِ مَنْ أَجْرٍ And I do not ask you for a recompense for it. إِنْ أَجْرِيَ إِلَّا عَلَىٰ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ My recompense is upon the Lord of the world. All of the prophets, or most of the prophets, to be more precise, in Surah Al-Shu'ara, most of the prophets mentioned in Surah Al-Shu'ara said these words to their people. So the question is, why would Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala repeat these statements? Why would he mention that Hud, Salih, Nuh, Lut, and Shuhaib salamullahi alayhim said the exact same words to their people? The answer is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indirectly wants to tell us that the messages of the prophets are in reality one message. The, ma the, the prophets of God, والسلام, they call to the same path and they call to the same message. All of them call to the path of what? Islam. Submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Quran al Karim makes it clear for us that all of God's Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi were what? Were Muslim. What's a Muslim? A Muslim is a person who submits to the commands and the will of Allah Jalla Jalla. Hence you find when you read the Quran al Kareem from cover to cover, when you read the Quran from Surah Al Fatiha to Surah Al Nas, you realize that Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about certain prophets and then comes forth and describes them for you telling you that this prophet was a muslim and that prophet was a muslim and that third prophet was also a muslim let me give you a bunch of examples on this regard as we connect the verses of the quran let's not forget we are living the month of ramadan and it is the month in which the holy quran descended Shahr ramadan let us start with Nuh alayhi salam, the prophet whose story we are analyzing at the moment. Allah Azza wa Jal speaks about Nuh in Surah Yunus and mentions what Nuh told his people. Part of the words he said was the following: "Wa umirtu an akuna min al muslimin and I've been commanded to be from the Muslims, meaning to be from those who submit to God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Question. When a prophet is commanded by Allah azza wa jal to perform a particular deed, does he obey God or disobey him? Obviously, he obeys him. 
So when Nuh says, I've been commanded to be from those who submit, from the Muslims, what does that mean? It means he submitted to God. It means he was a Muslim. This is Nuh. As for Ibrahim, Allah Azza wa Jal mentions him in Surah Al-Baqarah verse 131 as he says إِذْ When his Lord told him submit قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ He said I have submitted to the Lord of the worlds. He has submitted. Indeed Ibrahim's submission was impeccable. For it reached a level in which Ibrahim السلام, was willing to slaughter his own son for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He was willing and actually tried to slaughter his own son Ismail when Allah ta'ala commanded him to do so. This is how submissive Ibrahim السلام, was. Then again, Allah ta'ala mentions that Ibrahim and Ismail, both of them, were Muslim. Where? Also in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 128, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions their prayer, the prayer that they performed, the supplication, they performed when they were building the Kaaba. The bases of the Kaaba were present, but Ibrahim and Ismail alayhim salam were raising the Kaaba by completing its, its building. Nonetheless, as they were building the Kaaba, they recited a supplication, and part of it was the following. رَبَّنَا وَجَعَلْنَا مُسْلِمَيْنِ لَكَ Our Lord, make both of us, make both of us from those who submit to you, Ya Allah. Make us people who submit to you, O God. Here they're asking Allah Azza wa for what? They're asking Him for godly aid. The godly aid they need to actually submit to the Almighty. Then they say, وَمِن ذُرِّيَّتِنَا أُمَّةً مُسْلِمَةً لَكَ And bring a nation who will submit to you from our progeny. So here they're making two requests. Number one, they want Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to give them the God, the aid they need in order to submit to the Almighty. Secondly, they want Allah azza wa jal to bring a great nation from their offspring who will also submit to Allah jalla jalalu. What's interesting here is that there is a verse in the current Torah in the current Torah, in the Old Testament, that confirms what the Quran is saying. I'm not saying this to tell you that the Quran is in need of any other book to come forward and confirm its words. The Quran al Karim is an independent book, it's a strong and wise book that stands on its own feet, for it is the eternal miracle of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. However, I tell you that there is a verse in the current Torah that confirms what this verse in the Quran is saying so that those who believe in the current Torah, so that the Jews and or Christians who believe in the current Torah realize whatever the Torah is mentioning, was also mentioned in Al-Quran Al-Kareem that the current Torah is confirming what the Quran has said. What did the current Torah say? What did the current Torah say? It said in Genesis chapter 17 verse 20. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala apparently mentions that he, he, he answers a supplication done by Ibrahim alayhi salam. Ibrahim performs a supplication related to Ismail. So Allah Ta'ala responds to him saying, and regarding Ishmael, meaning Ismail, I have heard you. Meaning, 
I've heard you, and I will answer your prayer. Behold, I have blessed him, and I will make him fruitful, and I will multiply him exceedingly. So Allah is promising Ibrahim that he will bestow his blessing upon Ismail and that he will multiply him. What does that mean? It means that there will be a lot of people who will be part of Ismail's progeny. Then he says, he will beget 12 princes and I will make him into a great nation. Realize? Allah is giving Ibrahim good news or bad news? He's giving him good news. He's telling him there will be a great nation that will stem or that will be part of Ismail's progeny. Which means that nation won't be only abundant in number. It won't only be a huge nation when it comes to the number of people who are part of that nation. It will also be a nation that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For if Allah azza wa jal told Ibrahim alayhi, that Ismail will have a humongous offspring. However, that offspring will deviate. That offspring will be an evil offspring. That won't be good news to give to Ibrahim alayhi, Even if they're abundant in amount, Ultimately, if they're evil or they deviate, then that won't benefit Ibrahim much. It won't benefit him and it won't make him happy. Since Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, according to the current Torah, is giving Ibrahim good news when he tells him that there will be a great nation who shall come from the offspring of Ismail alayhi salam, this indicates that nation will be a good nation, a nation that pleases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and they will also be abundant in number. So here, the people, the people who believe in the current Torah must ask themselves, which nation is this? What nation is Allah ta'ala mentioning? Is it any nation other than the nation of Islam? Could it be any nation other than the nation of Islam? Other than the... Could it be any group other than the forefathers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa Rasulullah, Ahlul Bayt, and the Muslims who were from Ismail's progeny? Salamullah alayhi Secondly, realize Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions to Ibrahim that there will be 12 princes who will also be part of Ismail's progeny. The question is, who are those 12 princes? Have we forgotten that we believe in 12 imams and all of them are from the progeny of Ismail? Salamullah alayhi. Nonetheless, up until now, We've confirmed that the Quran says Nuh, Ibrahim, and Ismail were Muslim. They would submit, they submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now let us go to Yaqub and his children. The Quran al Karim tells you that Yaqub and his children were also what? Were also Muslim. As Allah says in Surah Al Baqarah, in Surah Al Baqarah, Verse 133, He says, Were you witnesses when Yaqub was on his deathbed? When he told his sons, What will you worship after me? Before we listen to their response, Realize Yaqub alayhi salam is on his deathbed and he's worried for his children. He's worried over what? Over their faith. What will they worship after my departure from this world? Such is the good father. A good father isn't only a man who cares for the 
for the uh, physical health or cares over the physical health of his children. A good father is one who cares over the spiritual health and physical health of his children. Bear in mind that the spiritual health of a person is more important than his physical health. Hence Yaqub alayhi salam, when he's on his deathbed, is worried, what will my children worship after me? When he asks them, they answer back, قَالُوا نَعْبُدُ إِلَاهَكَ وَإِلَاهَ آبَائِكَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ وَإِسْحَاقَ إِلَاهًا وَاحِدًا They said, we will worship your God and the God of your forefathers, Abraham, Ismail, and Isaac. When he is one God, meaning a God with no partners and no likes. وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ we will worship him as we are from those who submit to God subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the children of Yaqub were Muslim, which implies that Yaqub was also Muslim. Salamullah alayhi. Why? Because if Yaqub didn't want his children to be Muslim, if Yaqub wasn't pleased with Islam as a religion, when they said this word, he would have done what? He would have objected to their words. But on the contrary, Islam was his religion and they knew this. Hence, they said this word to please their father. So Yaqub and his children, according to the Holy Quran, were Muslim. Now let us go to Yusuf. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Yusuf. Bear in mind, Yusuf is one of Yaqub's children. But even then, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the prayer of Yusuf, the prayer he does after his calamities come to an end. In Surah Yusuf, Allah mentions that Yusuf alayhi, goes through different types of calamities. And so does Yaqub. When those calamities come to an end and the family is finally reunited in Egypt, Yusuf performs a supplication. In that supplication, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions that Yusuf was also Muslim. So he emphasizes on the Islam of Yusuf. What does Yusuf say? Part of what he said was the following. You can find it in verse 101 of Surah Yusuf. Anta waliyi فِي الدُّنْيَا وَالْآخِرَةِ تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا وَأَلْحِقْنِي بِالصَّالِحِينَ Oh Allah, you are my guardian in this world and the next. Which means you are the one who manages my affairs and leads me to what, to what is good. تَوَفَّنِي مُسْلِمًا Ya Allah, when you take my soul Take it as I am in a state of Islam, in a state of submission to you. And place me with those who are righteous. So Yusuf was also Muslim. Now let us go to Musa alayhi salam. Musa, the main prophet in Judaism. Jews, the Jews consider Musa alayhi salam to be their main prophet. To be the founder of their religion, correct? The Quran al Karim says even Musa was a Muslim. Where? In Surah Yunus, verse 84, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions what Musa told his people. وَقَالَ مُوسَى يَا قَوْمِ إِن كُنْتُمْ آمَنْتُمْ بِاللَّهِ فَعَلَيْهِ تَوَكَّلُوا And Musa said, my people, if you have believed in Allah, then rely on him. Realize how Musa alayhi salam considers reliance to be the natural effect of belief. If you believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, if you truly believe in Allah azza wa jal, then you won't find it extremely difficult to rely on him. How could you? 
when you believe in God and you believe in his power, in his knowledge, in his mercy, in his kindness, etc. And you know that if you rely on the Almighty, what will happen? If you rely on the Almighty, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala won't let you down. He will take care of your affairs and will take by your hand and lead you to what benefits you. So he tells them, In kuntum amantum billah, if you have believed in Allah, fa'alihi tawakkalu, then rely on him. In kuntum muslimin, if you are Muslims. So we realize that Musa alayhi salam is enjoining his people to be Muslims. Here we need to remember that the prophets of God alayhi salam, when they command their people to perform a particular deed, they perform it before them. Because the prophets are not only prophets of words, they're prophets of action as well. They put their words into action. They implement their teachings and words. So when a prophet commands his people to perform a deed, he performs it before them. And when a prophet forbids his people of committing a deed, he refrains from it before them. So if Musa is enjoining his people to be Muslim, meaning to be from those who submit, that means he is Muslim. He submits. In fact, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that the magicians of Pharaoh as well wanted to be Muslim. The, the, the magicians of Pharaoh as well asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make them from those who submit. So they understood that ultimately the message of Musa alayhi salam is a message of Islam. A message of submission. When did they ask Allah Ta'ala to make them from those who submit? Prior to their martyrdom. As you may know, the magicians of Pharaoh had committed a lot of sins in their life. But on the last day of their life, when the showdown happened between them and Musa alayhi salam, and they saw the miracle of Musa, which was the staff turning into a serpent, and they saw how that serpent actually came forward and started swallowing their ropes and staffs rapidly, they understood this was not magic. They knew themselves. They knew that they were magicians. But when they saw Musa's miracle, they knew this was a miracle from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they fell into prostration and believed in God, Moses and Aaron alayhim as -salam. When they revealed their faith, Pharaoh threatened them and promised to kill them in a vicious manner. So these magicians did what? They turned to Allah. Surat Al-A'raf tells us in verse 126, they said the following prayer, Rabbana, afrigh alayna sabra, our Lord, pour patience upon us they're asking Allah Ta'ala to pour patience upon them why because when you are afflicted with a severe punishment by an enemy of God you need to be patient lest you abandon your faith you need to be patient so that you remain faithful hence they asked Allah Ta'ala for patience and they said وَتَوَفَّنَا مُسْلِمِينَ and take our souls as we are in a state of Islam, in a state of submission. These are who? The magicians of Pharaoh. If we go to Sulaiman, Salamullahi alayhi, Allah Azza wa Jal also mentions that Sulaiman was a Muslim. When? When Allah mentions how Bilqis entered upon Sulaiman. Bilqis, the queen of Queen of Sheba, was a sun worshipper. She would worship the sun with her people. But also, she was guided through Sulaiman alayhi salam. And she entered upon Sulaiman and witnessed the marvelous kingdom that Sulaiman had. 
as you know, the prophets in general had miracles, right? Prophet him had different types of miracles that would confirm their prophethood. Sulaiman's miracle was his own kingdom. So when she saw the kingdom of Sulaiman she was mesmerized and said the following word according to Surah An-Naml verse 44. قَالَتْ رَبِّي إِنِّي ظَلَمْتُ نَفْسِي She said, my Lord, I have done injustice to myself. I've oppressed myself. وَأَسْلَمْتُ مَعَ سُلَيْمَانِ لِلَّهِ رَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ And I have submitted with Sulaiman. To who? To Allah, the Lord of the worlds. So she understood Sulaiman was a Muslim. And now she was announcing her Islam, saying, I've entered Islam as well. And I have submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If we go to the prophets of Banu Israel, Al-Quran makes a general statement telling us that the prophets of Banu Israel were also Muslim. Where? In Surah Al-Ma'idah, verse 44, Allah says, Inna. Surely, we have brought down the Torah and it contains, or as it contains, guidance and light. According to Sayyid Abdullah Shubbar Rahmatullah, the word guidance here refers to the pieces of knowledge found in the Torah which guide people to the straight path. Whereas the word nur, the word light, refers to the laws, the divine laws found in the Torah. Nonetheless, Allah says, surely we have brought down the Torah as it contains guidance and light. يَحْكُمُ بِهَا النَّبِيُّونَ الَّذِينَ أَسْلَمُوا لِلَّذِينَ هَادُوا he says the prophets would come forth and use this Torah to judge between who? To, between the Jews. But surprisingly, he tells you those prophets were what? Muslim. They had submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Last but not least. Allah tells you that Isa ibn Maryam alayhi salam was a Muslim. Isa, the main prophet in Christianity, the Quran al Karim says Isa alayhi salam was also Muslim. Where? In verse 52 of Surah Ali Hamran, as Allah says, فَلَمَّا أَحَسَّ Isa مِنْهُمُ الْكُفْرِ When Isa felt disbelief from them, meaning from the children of Israel. Not all of them were disbelievers, but some disbelieved, unfortunately. Now here we have to realize, disbelief is a metaphysical issue. So one might say, how did Isa feel disbelief from them? How did he feel their disbelief? The answer is, Isa, Isa witnessed certain actions or heard certain words from those people which indicated that they were disbelievers. So when he felt their disbelief, what did he do? He said, who will support me? Meaning, who will support my message and walk on the path that leads to Allah's pleasure? Who will support me and walk with me on the path which leads to Allah's pleasure? Here, a mysterious group of people who were known as the Hawariyu, these people made a statement. These people become the disciples of Isa. What did they say? We are the supporters of Allah. Meaning, of Isa, we will support you. And by supporting you, we will be supporting your Lord Allah Jalla Jalaluh. Amanna Billah. We have believed in Allah. Washhad bi anna muslimun. And bear witness that 
we have submitted that we are Muslims when they say and bear witness that we are Muslims this word indicates that Isa alayhi salam was also what? was also Muslim because he's asking them who is going to support me obviously if you want to support a prophet what do you do? you follow his teachings right? you follow his path you don't go against that path so by them saying وَنَحْنُ لَهُ مُسْلِمُونَ and we are from those who submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that means Isa also submitted after these words after connecting these verses together we realize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala confirms the submission of several prophets in the Quran as he mentions them by name here one might object and say however you haven't mentioned all the prophets there are much more prophets that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent to humanity tradition say Allah ta'ala sent 124,000 prophets to people to humanity and only about 30 of them were mentioned by name in the Quran. So what about the rest of the prophets? How could you make a claim? One will say, how can you make a claim that all prophets السلام, were Muslim, that all prophets submitted to Allah Azza wa Jal? We say, Allah Ta'ala mentioned that in the Quran. Just as he mentioned Nuh's Islam, Ibrahim's Islam, Ismail's Islam, Musa's Islam, Isa's Islam, and other prophets' Islam explicitly in the Quran, Allah made one bold statement in the Quran indicating that every prophet from the first to the last were Muslim. They were people who submitted to God subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where? In Surah Al Imran, verse 19, as he said. Surely the religion with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is what? Is Islam. When he says the religion with Allah is Islam, what does that mean? It means multiple things. Number one, number one, all of the prophets alayhim salam shared the same religion. They were all following the same path and same religion. Secondly, it means all of them called to Islam, meaning to submit to the Almighty subhanahu wa ta'ala. So the next time someone asks you, what was the first religion on the face of the earth? What was the first religion in the history of mankind? Your answer should be, Islam. For the history of mankind begins with who? It begins with Adam and Eve, alayhim as -salam. Adam was a prophet of God. And we said all prophets were what? Were Muslimin. They submitted to the Almighty, Jalla Jalla This leaves us with a question. What is Islam? I mean, we understand that you're saying Islam is submission. But what is submission? What is the core of submission? This is where we need to analyze a word uttered by the commander of the faithful, Amir al-Mu'mineen, Ali ibn Abi Talib, salawatullahi wa salamuhu alayh. Imam Ali delivered a fabulous sermon after the Prophet's demise, sallallahu alayhi wa alayh, known as khutbat al This sermon was delivered days after the Prophet's demise sallallahu alayhi wa alayhi. In it, he defined Islam. Hence, tonight, we're going to read the word of the Imam alayhi salam, and tomorrow, we'll dissect this important word in order to understand what the Imam sallallahu alayhi wa is saying. The word I'm about to recite can be found in multiple sources. You can find it in the book al Mahasin. You can find it. You can also find it in Al Amali for Sheikh Al Saduq, Rahmatullah. Bear in mind that there 
are a few versions for this word, and there are a few differences, slight differences in the different versions of Imam Ali's word. But in general, all of these sources have agreed on the major part of Amir al muminins word, salawatullahi wa salam alayhi. I'm going to narrate what Shaykh al-Saduq mentioned in his book, Al-Amani. He said that the commander, salamullah alayhi, the commander of the faithful said, لَأَنْسِبَنَّ الْإِسْلَامَ نِسْبَهُ لَمْ يَنْسِبْهُ أَحَدٌ قَبْلِي I shall describe and define Islam in a way no one has done so before me. وَلَا يَنْسِبُهُ أَحَدٌ بَعْدِي And no one will describe Islam in the same way, no one will describe and define Islam in the same way after me. There is, in addition, in another version of this hadith, which says, Illa which means the Imam is saying, no one will be able to define and describe Islam the way I will do so, Unless, unless he presents a similar definition to mine. So what is this definition? Let me give you, let me read it for you and give you the literal translation. And inshallah tomorrow we'll dissect it. He says, Al-Islam huwa taslim Islam is submission. Wa taslim huwa tasdiq Submission is belief. Wa tasdiq huwa al-yaqeen. And belief is certainty. And certainty is performance. And performance is action. The believer has taken his religion from his Lord and has not based his religion on his opinion. Ayuhannas, deenakum, deenakum, O people. Adhere to your religion. Adhere to your religion. Tamassaku bih. Hold on to it. La yuzilukum ahadun ana. Do not allow anyone to detach you from your religion. Lianna sayyata fihi tughfar. Lianna sayyata fihi khayrun min al hasana fi ghayre. He says, because committing a sin. Whilst you believe in your religion, meaning the religion of truth, is better than committing a good deed whilst you follow a false religion. Again, tomorrow we'll explain this statement. He said, this is because if a person commits a sin as he's following the religion of truth, his sin may be forgiven. Whereas, if a person is following a religion of falsehood, his good deed won't be accepted. What is the meaning behind this important word? Tomorrow, inshallah, we'll find out. Walhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa sallallahu ala al-Mustafa Muhammadin Wa alihi al-Tayyibin al-Tahirin